like to propose a podcast in which lesbians from all over the world can listen to lesbian affairs, and that can include anything from flannel shirts to cats, cat litter, cat sitters, hot cat sitters, lesbian affairs itself, um, politics, radical lesbians, veganism, non-veganism, anything. Welcome to a lesbian affair. How do we start off? Let's have a look. Happy Christmas, everybody, or happy holidays, wherever you are. It's it's that time of the year again. It's the a Lesbian Affair Lesmas special. And we're bringing this out to you on the 25th. But to those of you who have been celebrating on the 24th or the beginning of the month, or just throughout the whole of December, um, I hope you're having a good time and, and great holidays. And I'm delighted to be joined by Jane Trace for this episode. Jane, how are you? Happy Christmas. I'm well, thank you. I'm well, and I hope you are too, in spite of everything. Yes, yes, I'm doing okay. Um, yeah, you could see a Christmas tree in the background. So before we get talking about all things academia and lesbian history and lesbian refugee stories, uh, I just want to check in with you. How, how's your relationship to Christmas? How did that Christmas tree come about? Oh, I always have a Christmas tree. Sometimes I do it joyfully. Sometimes I do it out of a sense of duty. <laughs> um, uh, ooh, my relationship with Christmas has changed lots of times during my lifetime I think it's fair to say yes mm. you, you, you want me to enlarge on that <laughs> if you can <laughs> um, well my earliest Christmas memories are of a big family Christmas because I come from a big extended family in West London um, my granny was one of those sort of legendary old cockney ladies that uh, got everybody together at Christmas, cooked an enormous dinner, and we would sit down, 14 or 15 or 16 people some years. Um, When I look back on it, it's, I suppose it's a sort of formative thing. It's an absolutely traditional Christmas. We didn't actually have a turkey, um, though there were turkeys. I remember the turkeys hanging up by their feet outside the butchers. Gosh. But we used to have a great big chicken. I'm talking sort of not very long after the war. And we'd all be in Gran's big front room over the shop and we'd, we'd just eat ourselves, eat and drink ourselves to a state of complete exhaustion. And then at some point in the afternoon, Gran would say, now who's going to do their party piece? And everybody would have to do something. They'd have to sing or dance or, and eventually Uncle Billy would play the spoons and then people would eventually fall asleep but that's my kind of archetypal Christmas model if you like and it sets the bar quite high I mean after Gran got old and and couldn't do it anymore then my mum took that on so there were big family Christmases all through my childhood and that's what I think Christmas is like I suppose but for the majority of my grown-up life it wasn't like that at all (laughs) because oh dear the trouble with being old is everything you say comes out sounding like history right (laughs) um for most of my grown-up life I was in a lesbian relationship which was completely closeted Mm. we had neither of us ever come out to our parents and that meant that officially our relationship didn't exist so we just went home to our respective families for Christmas. Wow. So we never spent Christmas together. And so my grown-up Christmases were that kind of half-life that you have when you go home to your family. And I mean, you love your family and you do Christmas, but <clears throat> there's a whole part of you missing. And, you know, you're, telling, you're not telling the truth as well. And that, I think, is a very... Well, that's been a very formative kind of Christmas as well. And that went on for about 20 years until my mum died. And after that, we spent Christmases together. But that was quite a long, a long period. So I guess when you're, you know, when you're grown up, Christmas is always something that's better when you were a child, isn't it? But in recent years, oh, it's been different according to what's been happening. And now that I live on my own and I live near to my immediate family, we have lovely little Christmases together because um, we still do it. And as you see, I've got my treat and we should, well, <laughs> the last couple of years we haven't, of course, because the last couple of years have been COVID Christmases, haven't they? Yeah. And uh, last Christmas there were only three of us because of all the locking down and the mix not mixing of households. And this Christmas we're still hoping 
that half a dozen or so of us will get together. But the half of that party that was in London are currently all having COVID. So they're all isolated. So Christmas will probably be something like the 28th of December once we've counted up the isolation days. <laughs> but we, <laughs> we shall still do it. Because there was a year when I didn't do Christmas at all. Just one. It was at a very, very bad time of my life. I was suffering from a very deep depression. And I just couldn't face Christmas at all. So I persuaded my family that it was too far to come. I was at that time living a very long way away from them, um, that I was going to spend Christmas with friends. And then I persuaded all my friends that I was going home to see my family for Christmas. So everybody thought I was going to be all right. Nobody worried about me. And actually, I didn't go anywhere. I stayed at home. And on Christmas Day, I painted the kitchen. Mm. And even then, I couldn't sustain it because in the evening, uh, there was a knock on the door and the two lovely lesbians who were renting my holiday cottage for Christmas said, we haven't got a corkscrew we've just discovered. Have you got one? And I said, yes, I will run and fetch you one. And they said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm painting the kitchen. And they said, oh, for God's sake, come and share this bottle of champagne. So we sat around my stove and shared the bottle of champagne. And the next day, the, na- the lesbian neighbours up the road discovered that I was on my own and whisked me off to share the rest of their family Christmas. So my attempt to not do Christmas was only half successful, really. Wow. And when the sun came out in the spring... I realised that it was a very bad time of year to paint the kitchen anyway because I'd done it very badly because it was so dark. Um, so ever since then, I've had Christmas again and it's a much better thing to do. Wow, yeah. Now, Christmas is a real tussle and I was struck by what you said about um, closeted Christmases. I, I think I had one of them once. Not good. No, but it, it was very surreal because at the time, my, my girlfriend wasn't out to her flatmates and she had hidden me, sort of smuggled me oh. in and out of her flat. So, so they didn't even know I was there. It was, it was very quiet, tucked away. I, I knew their shower schedules by heart, so I would sometimes <laughs> go get the shower when everybody was not doing it or out. That's really closeted. You don't get more closeted than that. <laughs> were you actually literally in a closet? Yeah, yeah. And I was, we, were, we were in her room closet, yeah. <laughs> but it, it was my first relationship, my, my first proper relationship. We were very young. And um, it just so happened to be two weeks before Christmas. I remember to this day, we're standing in Archway tube station on the platform and it was supposed to be our goodbye just before Christmas. You know, I was about to go to the airport. She was about to go up to Liverpool to see her family. And one of her flatmates came onto the platform <laughs> just, oh. just, just by random coincidence. And I remember she let go, went two meters further and started talking to him as if I didn't exist and then took the tube in front of me. <laughs> no. Uh, and, and that was our goodbye for Christmas. And I think that was our first fight as well. <laughs> I mean, the good news is that the relationship lasted four more years after that. And we did come out and, and um, we moved in together and all sorts. So it wasn't necessarily uh, a bad thing. But it was certainly a challenge to live through that I think straight couples maybe wouldn't understand. <laughs> no, I, I'm sure they wouldn't. And I hope there's a lot of, of lesbian and gay couples now wouldn't understand it. I hope, I hope those times are horrible. I hope so too. <laughs> oh, God, yes, what a dreadful story. Yeah, no, but it's a good story now. I mean, she's yeah. she's happily married and um, very out. So, and we're still friends, as it goes. As it goes. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm I'm seeing a Christmas tree behind you again, and I'm, I'm just wondering, Christmas trees are a little bit personal. Like, do you have a system and and how you decorate them? Does does some of this stuff have meaning, or do you just? Well, This is a very, very small tree. I've always had a tree. I've always had a real tree because I just don't like artificial trees. So, and I have, um, as most people I think of any age have, a little box with all the bits that hang on the tree in it. And each year I put up the same decorations on the tree. And each one of them has a memory and a story And sometimes it's quite hard to do that because sometimes it's sad and sometimes it isn't. But during COVID, I've acquired another tree, but it's one of those artificial little artificial white trees with the branches all covered in lights. It's a white tree. And I don't save it for Christmas. I put it up and light it as soon as the clocks go back. 
you know, I did it in the first COVID winter and it brought me great joy. And especially when you come down on a very dark morning, it's the first thing I switch on and it shines away there in the corner. And uh, it's been lovely. And I've, I've got it again this winter. But it stands in the place where I used to put my Christmas tree. So that was a dilemma, wasn't it? And uh, that's why I've now got a very small Christmas tree up on this, sitting on the top of this cupboard, as you see, because <laughs> the place where the Christmas tree really stands is filled up with this, the tree of light. And I like the tree of light very much. And at Christmas, I hang a few red balls on it. But and So I've got two trees, really. It's about all I do in the way of Christmas decorations, apart from put the cards up. Oh, and put a wreath on the front door. Yeah. But that's the same old wreath every year as well. So Christmas is very ritualised, I suppose, for me, Christmas decorations and tree, because there's no innovation. I'm not one for it. Oh, I don't like it. No, no, no. I like I like a bit of ritual, <clears throat> like my dad. And... Um, and that's 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 what I do with my tree. Yeah, I think you're right. It's, it's all about rituals, and and I'm I'm glad you came out of the closet about the the second tree. You've got two of them. Oh, the second yeah. tree. Yeah. Um. So I, I'm just wondering. You talked about the sense of, for example, depression around Christmas, and I think there is a dark side that we in the community particularly can be affected by sometimes, and that people don't talk about. So yeah, I mean, the expectations around Christmas are ridiculously yeah. high. You know, culturally, we're just we just st why do we still believe that Christmas is a time when everybody's happy and merry and surrounded by their loving family? Because it no. it isn't. It's a miserable time for lots of people, and especially <clears throat> this last year or two, I've been aware of people who couldn't visit with friends and family because of of the pandemic. Um, and certainly, my Christmas this year will. Um, my Christmas morning is always got. I've always got a list of people that I phone up because I know they're on their own. And this year there'll be a couple of people in the village that I will probably go and knock on their doors just to say happy Christmas because I know they're on their own. Um, and it's just about lowering your expectations and getting through, I think. <laughs> the other thing I I probably ought to do this Christmas is to check in with my friends who are refugees um, because we do have a monthly Zoom meeting. But uh, and we had it for this this month. We had it last week, and it was lovely to see everybody. And we were very very happy. People were very happy to see each other uh, <clears throat> because their isolation has been worse than most. But I think probably we ought to have one on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day just to make sure that everybody gets to talk to somebody once. So in in a sense, what you're saying is an acknowledgement of the hardship that can come with Christmas, but it's also a message of hope because what we can do for each other is reach out and actually knock on doors and, and give a call. Totally. And I mean, we also phone up, you know, phone up relatives abroad and things on Christmas. We always do that. But I think you know, there's, there's probably somebody who would like to hear from you on Christmas Day. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good thought. And that goes back to my granny because we didn't always just sit down family. I can remember several Christmases in which there were kind of strange people at the table because either my mum or my grandma decided they were going to be on their own and hadn't got a Christmas dinner. So they fetched them in. And I think that's... Well, to be cheesy about it, that's what Christmas is all about, isn't it? Oh, I think we've got permission to be cheesy today. <laughs> so that's great. <laughs> so, but you mentioned refugees and um, maybe this is a good point in time to segue into what I also wanted to talk to you about, which is your academic work, your journey into oral history projects and uh, your books. You've just brought out a book uh, titled Free to Be Me, Refugee Stories from the Lesbian Immigration Support Group. So you've collected stories from older lesbians, you've collected stories from within uh, communities that are usually a little bit far off. Um, it's, it's really fascinating to see the genesis of your work. And now you've kind of ventured into a actually more political territory as well, because refugee stories, I, I'm not sure if you would agree, do you think that you can tell refugee stories without also kind of like dipping a little bit into politics? I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I actually think all history can be a form of activism. I think that's how it came about and, and why it was invented. Because if you go back to the beginning of oral history, which is probably in the 1970s, I guess, the idea behind that was very much that history was written. You know, history is written by the winners, they always say, don't they? Which means history as recorded is usually about white men, basically, certainly about men, and certainly about the ruling classes, because... If you're literate, you can record your history, and if you're not, you can't. 
So there was a great movement in the 1970s alongside all the other libertarian movements of the time uh, to find a way of making working class history, what they called history from below, and hearing the voices of people whose voices had been silenced. And so that was how, um, how oral history really began. And it was very much focused on working class history and community history. But, of course, it's been an absolutely perfect tool, both for feminists and for now, the LGBTQ community. Uh, I belong to a group of LGBTQ plus historians, and we feel that over the last 50 years, let's say, um, the lives of gay people in this country have changed so much that we need to collect the memories of people who remember what it was like before. And that's very much my motivation as well. Mm. And I just have, it was because I'd been recording lives, as you know, of very old women who identify as lesbian, bisexual. Um, it was because the people in Manchester in the immigration support group had, had heard that work, had seen that work of mine, that they got in touch with me in the first place. So, yes, I suppose it's always been a bit political. But once I got involved with the Lesbian Immigration Support Group and the women there who are refugees or who are seeking asylum in the UK, then it became very political. And all the theoretical arguments about whether you can stay objective and whether you, uh, you know, you take the side of the person whose life you're recording, uh, well, those theories went out the window because it became very, very clear to me that absolutely I take the side of those women. And that's what I was doing. And that was why I was making the book. So, yes, yes, very political. Um, fancy you could become an activist in your 70s and not know it. Very good, <laughs> very good. Yeah, I, I mean, I often mention on the podcast that I do believe that the private is political and it's usually exactly what you're saying, the sense of if you steer into severe limitations, maybe even life-threatening limitations within your own life, then it is a call to action to, to explore how you can change things in order to survive. There's a lovely old quote from Jackie Forster back in the day. God, you're so young, Jess, I don't suppose you even remember who Jackie Forster was. I do. Was. You do, you do, yeah. great. Um, <laughs> she said once um, that she was fed up with being told by people, well, it doesn't matter to me what you do in bed. And they thought that was a good thing to say because they thought they were being very tolerant and lovely and so on. And she said, well, it actually does damn well matter what I do in bed because because of what I do in bed, that my family have thrown me out and I've lost my job. That I, you know, And what she was saying was exactly what you're saying. Private is political. Um, and and we, have to, we have to make that clear. Yeah. So before we go into the book and, and sort of the genesis of how this book came about, I want to just kind of draw a little bit of a backdrop as to who you are, because you, you're a researcher, you're solidly working for higher education, and you found your own feet within the community, um, based on also the research that you've been doing. So can you just tell me a little bit about your background, uh, career-wise? Absolutely. Um, for 35 odd years, I was a school teacher. Um, and because of that period of time, I mean, I started going to work as a teacher in secondary schools in 1967, and I retired in 2000, or was it 2001? 2001, I think. And during that time, well, the first part of my teaching career, it was absolutely unthinkable for gay teachers to be out. Um, the one or two who were, I salute and, and give huge respect to, and there are some such, but the majority of us just stayed in the closet. And then towards the second half of my teaching career, uh, of course, we were under Section 28, which made it technically at least illegal to teach anybody anything about alternative lifestyles. Um, so that was me um, for a great deal of my life until I was nearly 60. And then after I retired, uh, I'd been coming out slowly for quite a long time, but by the time I was retired, I was completely out. And I decided to go back to university and that was where my new life began really and I think I do think of it as a new life I think of myself as having lived a life that's long ago and far away um, and my new life started when I went on a one-year postgraduate course to the University of Birmingham in 2008 I think it was 
and I did a I did a single year postgraduate master's degree in gender studies. I wanted to do something completely different. I wanted to do something I felt was relevant to my life um, and would, would just wake up my brain. And it was just the most wonderful thing I've ever done. Um, it was life changing. It, by the time I got to the end of that year, I was absolutely hooked. I wanted to do a PhD. And since I'd been studying in my master's, um, the fact that older lesbians, people like me, were pretty much culturally invisible. Um, they, don't, they don't turn up, you know, in those days particularly, they didn't turn up on television, they didn't turn up in books, and they didn't turn up in this so-called gender studies course either. So I wrote a little th- thesis about the invisibility of older lesbians, <laughs> and then I went on to write a PhD thesis, uh, which was intended to make them visible. And that was where the old lesbians came in. So I said to my supervisor, do you think it would be overambitious to hope that I can reach 100 older women um, with my with my survey that I've made, my little questionnaire? And she said, because she's like that, oh, 100, months, yeah, go for 200. I thought, oh, God. Um, so I put this questionnaire out there and within three months, um, within minutes, Really, I had 400 answers, and there were just these old lesbians all over the country. They were all over the country too, um, just saying, "Do it, Jane." You know, let let us say what, let us be heard. They didn't want to be per- personally, individually outed, but they wanted their stories heard and they wanted their voices heard, and it was so encouraging. So that was how it all began. And to um, illustrate what I was writing about then. I have to say, if you're writing an academic thesis, it's very good to have 400 old lesbians and lots of num- numbers to crunch because they like numbers and, and statistics. And you can make graphs, you make graphs about old lesbians. People really believe you. But the graphs yeah. don't mean anything. I mean, the, the big question everybody wanted asked, because the thing about these old lesbians was nobody had really ever told them anything much about other people like like ourselves. So I said to them, well, okay, what questions should I put in this questionnaire? And they came up with things like, um, well, how many old uh, lesbians have actually been married, heterosexually married? Because in those days when I was doing this, there wasn't any gay marriage. Yeah. Um, because one of them said, who, who asked me to ask this question said, you know, I feel really out of it in my old lesbian group because I'm the only person there that's been married and I think they, they look down on me for not being a real lesbian. And then another woman in a different group said to me, um, do you think all old lesbians have been married at some point? Because I'm the only one in my old lesbian group who um, has never been married and I've been a lesbian all my life and I really feel a bit odd. So that was quite an interesting question. And um, it turned out to be almost exactly half and half. (laughs) It was 51% of women over 70 who now identify as lesbians had been married and 40% of them had children. And so we had already an interesting diversity within the group, those who had lived at some point a more or less heterosexual life and those who hadn't. Um, So it just got more and more interesting. But if you just say 51% of old lesbians have been married, it doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't tell you why or whether they liked it or how it was. So that was why I did also a lot of, oral history at that point, interviewing people about their lives and listening to the ones who said, I got married because I thought it would make me straight, right through to the ones who said, well, I got married because I loved my husband and I did love him and I loved him for a long time and now I love my wife. Um, so there were there were a lot of uh, nuances, a lot of variety within the statistics that only came out if you listen to stories. And it was the stories that hooked me after I'd finished the PhD. And I was quite glad to stop crunching the numbers. And I was very glad to stop writing an academic thesis, I can tell you, as a right task. Um, but I couldn't give up the stories. And that's how it all happened. And I, I realise now, it, when I say that I started my PhD in 2009 and, and I started back to university in 2008, it's, it's more than 10 years I've been doing it now. It's, it's a good long while. And it shifts and changes, but the stories are the thing, yeah. It's amazing how um, you, you described finding your new life at the age of 60. And, and when you said that, I thought, ah, oh, she's a born-again lesbian academic. 
Yes, um, I'm not really an academic. I, I was very glad to be able to access academic learning again because I suppose, I don't know, an academic is a person who spends their life in the academy, I think, and I don't mm. think I'm cut out for that. Uh, I, I'm not an ivory tower sort of person. But to be able to use my brain and have my brain stimulated again after a long time of not that was wonderful and and it was wonderful while it lasted but I didn't want to stay in that academic environment really I live on the edge of it but now that I've got the confidence that it gave me this last book for instance I don't think I could have written it within an academic context in the same way because as you've pointed out it is it is biased if you like it's <laughs> it, it's um it's a piece of political campaigning, really, as well as a piece of oral history. I guess what you're saying is I'm I'm not institutionalised by any means, and I, I got stuck with the oral history part, the, the, mm. the yeah. activism that lies within giving voice to people who are disenfranchised and who don't have a voice. It's funny that, because I always thought of myself as a very institutionalised person. One of the things I loved about teaching all those years was that sense of belonging to a community, to an institution, um, but now I've learned, I've learned to be independent. Took a long time, didn't it? <laughs> oh, I don't know if it ever stops. I think that's the beauty of, of being curious and also critical thinking. You know, you can't just, yeah. it's yeah. nice to belong, but sometimes you need to challenge that as well, I think. So and yeah. I think universities can become silos of groupthink sometimes. It's, it's sometimes really hard if you have a certain subject that challenges the status quo. It was actually... I mean, literally half a century. It was 50 years almost to the day uh, since I'd gone to university the first time um, when I did my undergraduate degree back in the early 1960s. It really was about learning and growing and learning for life. It wasn't about qualifying you for anything in particular. It was just a wonderful opportunity to stretch your brain and think about new things. Um, but now the universities are very, very neoliberal places. They're very much about grant funding and about putting in forms and jumping through hoops, really. Um, it was very, that was educational as well. It's so interesting to hear from somebody who actually went to university late in life and, and who has that ability to compare the mentality change of the institutions. Like I get the sense that universities are a business these days that yeah, absolutely. need to... And I wouldn't, I wouldn't yeah. say you have to go to university, but I certainly would say, and I used to say to, this, to the little girls that I taught, especially the ones that went off the rails bit and got pregnant and left school and did things like that, the last thing I always used to say to them was, it's never too late. You don't have to learn just when you're at school. And one of the interesting things about the old lesbians, actually, that I surveyed was the number of them that had achieved their academic or work qualifications, not when they were student age. They'd had other things happen to them in life. And I think it's a female thing as much as anything, because especially in my generation, you could get derailed into just getting married and having kids and not expecting to do anything for yourself. And a lot of women I know have come to, to further education later on in life. So that's definitely something I would say to people. Never too late. Uh, retirement is a huge adventure if you get that far do anything well i think it's inspiring i mean i as you were talking i was just revisiting the female figures in my family and i know that for example my grandmother she was a laboratory assistant and then laboratory leader manager working in a chocolate factory in the communist part of germany so that was not her passion but she was damn good at it yeah. she was yeah. very intelligent she could really adapt to anything that's amazing and she she chose that because it was going to pay the best that was the the matrix up in which she chose her job absolutely and my mother growing up in communist germany she she is a language talent but she couldn't learn the languages she wanted to like English, ironically. So mm -hmm. she speaks five former Soviet country languages. Okay. And um, yeah, a light goes up in her eyes whenever mm -hmm. you talk about sentence structures. If you ever want to distract that woman, just, just ask her what the cases in Russian are and she'll, she'll go off on one. But wow. it, it is somewhat bittersweet because it reminds me of the hunger for education within, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's very interesting what you say because they obviously had the ability to make good of what they, the choices they did have, limited those, those choices were. And I, I think, listening to you, I'm thinking, I assume that much younger people than, than I am have got a lot of choice now, but maybe maybe we never have completely open choice. Maybe our, our lives and our situations always 
always limit our choices in some way. And I think the, the greatest gift my mother ever gave me probably was the ability to make the best of the hand you're dealt. Um, she was she could have done so much more in a different time and under different circumstances. Um, but she was very good at making the best of what she had. Uh, maybe that's what we do. I think so. I think you said something about history being written by the victors. And I was just reminded that I think it was Mark Twain who said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And it certainly feels like that in my family, right? Oh, that's wonderful. I haven't yeah. heard that before. That's <laughs> excellent. That's excellent. Yeah. But but let's have a look at the um, the book because uh-huh. it does feel like the stories in this book rhyme too, but in different ways. It was very touching to read, and I was just wondering how did you arrive at the subject matter? Uh, it wasn't something that I would ever have thought that I would know anything about or or ever write about. It was a complete surprise to me. And how it happened was that I previously wrote a book which is called Now You See Me. And it was the after event, really, from what I've been describing with my researches. When you write an academic thesis, you have to make points and illustrate them. And I illustrated them with little snippets out of these wonderful stories that I'd gathered. And I never had the chance at that point to use any of the whole stories. So I decided that I would make a book out of some of the the life stories at length, let the women's voices be heard right through. When you ask an old person to talk about their life, very interesting. Very often they know exactly what the story is. It's got a beginning, a middle and an end. And beware of interrupting and asking them another question because they will go on with the story they've got. So the stories I had had shape. They were beautiful and they were all very varied. So I put some of them, about 20 of them, into this book called Now You See Me. It sold extraordinarily well, actually. I was very surprised because I thought I was just giving it back to the people that given me their stories, really. I was giving it back to my community of old lesbians, and I was just sort of saying, there you are, girls, this is what I've done for us. But actually, it's just sold and sold and sold. It might sell some more. We're going to put a link to it in the description, I think. Okay. Um, Well, because of this book spreading fairly widely, I'm always getting um, interesting emails and messages from all sorts of people I don't know uh, who've read the book and want to talk to me about one thing or another. And one day, um, about a year after the book was published, I had an email from a woman living in North Yorkshire saying, as so many people say, you don't know me, but I know your work. And she explained that she was working for something she called the Lesbian Immigration Support Group, which actually is in central Manchester, which is quite a journey for her. And they support women who come to the UK and who claim asylum here on the grounds of their sexual orientation, the fact that they've been, you know, they can't live anymore bearably in their own country. And very often they've been very, very badly treated before they get away. And she said, the reason we're asking you is that we're currently supporting a woman. She's been turned down for um, refugee status by the Home Office because they don't believe she's a lesbian. And we don't really know how to help her next. She's quite unusual among our refugee uh, members and and women seeking asylum because she's in her 70s. And we wondered um, whether you've got anything in your research which you could help us with, you know, any facts or figures or, or arguments about what you know about old lesbians that could persuade the Home Office that this woman really is one. And she told me a bit about the woman's background. And she's exactly the same age as I am. And I just sat here, Jess. I can remember it. It was one of those moments in your life. I I just sat here and I thought, my God, there's this woman who is the same age as me, who has had this utterly, utterly different life. And now she's in a strange country, which is refusing to believe her story and is going to deport her to some... And in the time she'd been in England... Her lesbian partner back in Uganda had actually been murdered. And I just thought, of course I can. Of course I can. I've got all this stuff. Mm. And, I, you know, I'd done all this research for my own benefit and my own enjoyment. And somebody was giving me the opportunity to use it for somebody else's good. So that was just brilliant. And I wrote a huge long letter. But I thought, well, I'd better go meet her and find out what she's like and so on. And that was the beginning of a lovely friendship. We're both 76 now, 
Um, so it took a few years longer because the Home Office were very, very sticky about it and very refusing to believe anybody. In the end, we had to go to court for the very, very final time and actually say to the judge, look, yes, she's a lesbian. I say so. Um, and on the day that she finally got her refugee status, we were just all emotionally exhausted and terribly, terribly happy. And we all went off to the cafe that they used to um, to have a cup of tea and rejoice. And um, on that day, I had met quite a lot of other members of the Lesbian Immigration Support Group. And I have to tell you, they are awesome women, all ages, from all co- many, many countries, all gone through the most horrific experiences. As you know, you've read the book. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I hadn't understood before was that a lot of the horrific experiences are actually imposed on them when they get here by our own Home Office and Border Force. And I I just didn't have that knowledge about my own country. Uh, it made me quite, actually quite ashamed to be British for quite a long time because I thought, you know, we've always had in history this reputation for taking people in and looking after them. And we are just mistreating particularly LGBT asylum seekers um, and within that group, the minority who are women, we're just treating them really, really badly. So I looked around this lovely group of fabulous women and I said to them, I think you're my next book. I've been looking for a project. And so we set out. (laughs) What we didn't know was that we're going to end up writing a book in lockdown. That wasn't part of the plan. (laughs) The pandemic came in between. The pandemic, yes, because we started... I started the interviews in the end of February in 2020. Um, And by the beginning of May, I couldn't go to Manchester anymore. Everything was locked down. Um, Fortunately, I had about a dozen interviews by then, and that was what we used for the book. But it meant there was nothing else to do. So that book got written faster than any other book's ever been written, I think. It was written and published in a, in a year, which is quite unusual. And boy, are we lucky that it, it got published. But I'm, I'm interested in what you said around being ashamed to be British, because I find that that is always such an interesting scale for me or spectrum, because I always am an immigrant myself, mm. ashamed of being German. <laughs> trying to eradicate my German accent and everything. So I know that feeling of being ashamed of it, but I've had to tussle with that quite a bit. So I'm actually quite proud to be British. But when I say that, that means something different than when you would say it or other people. And as you were saying, I was thinking, hang on, what are we ashamed of sometimes? And I think if I were to talk about myself, I was ashamed of the atrocities that the German state had committed, for example. Of course. Like obviously. Of and course. then I was thinking of... As you were talking, ironically, you would be a Brit that could be proud of being British because what you do with the refugees is not necessarily what the state is doing, which is this re-traumatizing. And I think that's what we're going to go into in a, in a bit. So when we say I'm ashamed to be British, mm. it depends on who says it, but it also depends on what we mean with what Britishness is. Is it the state? Is it the government? Is it the structures? Or is it the people? And by the sounds of it, the people who are part of the um, support group, they're They should be proud to be British. Yes, uh, you're, you're, you're absolutely right, of course. And I, they are, and I, it made me made me quite moved to hear the lovely things they said mm. about how kind people have been to them and so on, in spite of actually having had a lot of people be institutionally very unkind to them. Yeah. But, yes, um, the, kindness, the kindness of strangers, for instance, figures very much in the book. No, I wouldn't say I was ashamed of being British any more than I would say I was proud of being British. I don't think it's actually a, a thing to take pride in. It's an accident yeah. of birth. <laughs> But I think you can be um, you can be embarrassed yeah. by the other people who are part of your tribe. As you were embarrassed for the atrocities of, of yeah. the 20th century, um, you know, we can all be embarrassed about slavery and colonialism and what have you. But it wasn't us personally that did it. And I suppose the responsibility it lays on us is is to be different isn't it ourselves I, I yeah thank you for for indulging me in philosophizing about that because i've thought about that a great deal over the last few years obviously based on my story and i think it's interesting in a sense because embarrassment and shame as a feeling probably in my eyes have the purpose of behavior correction mm. yeah so it's a call to change it's a reflective thing it is it can also be quite toxic mm. whereas pride at its worst can be a delusion a denial uh, and can lead to atrocities. It's an unreflexive thing. I, I, I need to tell you a story about 
the Second World War, I think, my darling. Okay. Um, my father, of course, fought in the Second World War. He was a very young man. He was very badly wounded and was disabled for the rest of his life. I went to school, secondary school, in the late 1950s, which, I mean, I don't remember the war, but I look back now and I realise how everybody around me, all the grown-ups, did. And my headmistress, who was a funny old thing, really, we didn't, you know, we used to take the mickey out to her like you do, but she set up, in the late 1950s, um, school links and exchange visits with a girls' school in Germany. Wow. I knew my parents were very unhappy about this, and I knew most of the parents were, and they muttered in their beards and went, oh, bloody Germans, and so on. <laughs> but she did it. And when I look back, I think what an extraordinarily brave and far-sighted thing that was for her to do, because, you know, kids, as I say, laugh at, people in authority over them and we giggled because she said she didn't actually speak German so she and the headmistress of the German school had to talk to each other in Latin but they did um and and these this this relationship continued and I think what she was saying to us was your generation didn't do this it's for you to mend it Mm. and to mend the relationships um and I look back now and I think gosh that was quite far-sighted really because the war wasn't that far away so I give you that. Do do with it, with it what you will. I think it's beautiful because it, it illustrates maybe what I was trying to express. It's a sense of, in extreme forms, both internalized shame or shame in general and pride can be a dehumanizing factor. And what this mm. headmistress did was she humanized relationships mm. again. And, and that's beautiful. Absolutely yeah. right. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, good, good. I, I knew there would be somebody one day that I needed to say it to. But when you talk about internalized shame, of course, you always also make me think about the homophobia that so many of my generation yeah. had to struggle with for so long. Because if you're surrounded by people telling you you're wrong and wicked, it's very hard not to believe it. Yeah, because it's also designed to isolate you and to not talk about it. Absolutely. So shame shame only really mm. thrives in silence. And that's, that's a very hard thing. Mm. But yeah. Um, moving to the book, because I feel like I've run away with some philosophizing there. <laughs> <laughs> But it's really nice to talk to you about these things. You've got very light touch in the way you've arranged these stories. And whenever there is a commentary, it's clear that it's you because it's cursive. (laughs) You've put certain things into italics to just provide a bit of context, which is really lovely. And then we go into the stories, which really read like the voices of the people that you interviewed. Well, I'm very pleased and relieved to hear you say that, because actually, of course, it's all an illusion. (laughs) Um, And it would be... I mean, in some senses, I say, yes, I am just, I'm the conduit through which the voices come. But you have to be honest about this. I'm the one that does the the writing yeah. and the editing. And some of these, particularly the first story in the book, she doesn't, her English, she, she was struggling in places I, for me even to understand what she was saying when I was listening to her with my ears. So getting it down on paper was, was quite a challenge. And the challenge is not to take the person's, personality out of those words and not to take their voice because her voice is very particular i can hear her now that particular woman at the end when she would come to the end of a little bit of her story and she would clap her hands she would go (laughs) and and to to get that that person into the writing and then to give it to them and and make for them to alter it and agree with it or disagree and to say yes this does sound like me and the idea is that you end up with something that they actually think was exactly what they did say and that you feel in in all sort of honesty Mm. that that is them talking but something which at the same time is coherent enough as a written piece for the reader um and it's it's really ethically it's quite challenging because you don't want and, and this this particular time, it was even more so because, of course, here I am, an old white woman telling the stories of women of colour, mm. um, you know, who are mainly speaking in their second language and, and not, um, you know, and doing right by them uh, and, and keeping them in the forefront was really, really important. So it was, it was a really interesting piece of work um, and that, really very challenging but very, very rewarding. Well, I think you, you put great effort into it and it did read as though it were different voices and and i felt like the the personalities did jump jump through on the page for me at least um i think grace yeah who, who was the first story or the first narrative yeah it was grace, was grace wasn't it? yes and grace was actually the woman i was talking about who was your age 
was the beginning of it all, mm. yes. Um, now, proving that you're lesbian in order to claim asylum is a bit of a hilarious concept in itself. And I was wondering if you could Much hopefully. tell me a little bit about that, but also how that involved you. I think it was Grace where you had to prove that you could prove that she was a lesbian. So it's not even just about proving that somebody's a lesbian. It's about proving that you're an expert enough. About whether I'm an expert on lesbians or not. That, that story. Yes, exactly. How do you prove that you're an yes, expert? I, did, I, didn't, I didn't put that in the book, but it was. <laughs> when I, I, in my simplicity, replied to that original email, and then I sat down and wrote a three or four page letter, and I threw the book at them. I put all the letters after my name and I put Sussex University on top of the paper and all this. I'm not stuff I, I normally do, but dear home office, here I am and I'm as good as you and this is what I know. So I wrote that I had done all this research and that I was, you know, pretty expert in what I was talking about. And then I hit them with some of the numbers that I referred to earlier. I gave them the percentages and the thing. And I said to them, you know, an old lesbian, a lesbian can be old. A lesbian can have been married. A lesbian can be a grandmother and a great grandmother. And here are the here are the, all the stuff out of my research to prove it. Bloody bloody blah. And also, I've met this woman, and I'm a lesbian, and I think she's one. <laughs> and gaydar works. So I like this, <laughs> but in very in very posh very posh language. And uh, I sent it off. And it was only after they refused her again, um, and she was down to have her final appeal that I discovered from the solicitor that one of the reasons they'd been able to refuse her for yet another time being that they had discounted my evidence. So I was a bit peeved, and I said to this solicitor, why do you mean they've discounted my evidence? So she said, well, I'll send you the, the letter where they explain why they still aren't believing you. And in this letter, I discovered that there's some sort of clause somewhere in some Home Office document which says that you need not regard a person as an expert just because they say they are. Mm. A person can't say themselves that they're an expert. But they never told me this. So I thought, right. <laughs> and, and the solicitor said to me, we've only got three days before the final papers for the final hearing have to go in. So I wrote, it was a Friday, I think, and I wrote emails to the three most important queer academics I knew professors, all of them. And I said, look, it's Jane, and I know it's the weekend. Can you possibly help me? Could you could you write a letter saying that I'm an expert on old lesbians? <laughs> and I said to these three people, because as I say, it was a weekend, and I only had till Monday, um, and they might not even read their emails over the weekend, and they might not want to write a, a reference in that time. And bless them, by Monday morning, I had three answers because look they all stepped up they all wrote me the most fulsome embarrassing references saying how i was a world expert in old lesbians etc um and I said, sounds good to me it doesn't sound I embarrassing sent, sent all these off to the solicitor and i did say i do realize this is overkill and just pick one you know i don't mind if you don't use them all obviously and she wrote back and said jane there is no overkill in this business The odds are so stacked against people like Grace, we will fire every bullet in our gun. So they sent these things off. And, of course, when we finally got to court on that nervous morning, um, the, the barrister had all these letters all sort of spread out, um, and he said to the judge, um, I hope you've read all these letters, my lord. And the judge said, yes. And he said, so you, you realise that uh, Dr. Trace is this, that and the other, and she's come all the way from Brighton. <laughs> Um, and that was it, really. But it took all that time, and it was just could so easily have gone wrong. I mean, it was just just such a ghastly thing. Uh, I've got a picture of me and Grace standing outside the tribunal office, arm in arm. I think we are, and both looking absolutely shell shocked <laughs> because at the very end of that trial, the judge did something. I mean, I'd never been to one before, so I didn't know what happened, but I understood that we didn't get the judgment there and then. You have to wait normally at least a fortnight, sometimes a very much longer, to hear what the judge decides. But he decided to tell us. And he was he said, um, now you do understand, don't you, that you won't have my judgment today? And we all said, yes, yes, yes. And he said, but uh, I think I can say, um, oh, yeah, he was milking it. He was loving it. He was said, uh, 
I think I can say with some confidence that uh, when you do receive my, my judgment, you will be pleased. And we just all went, oh. Excellent. And then everybody started to shout and cry. And it was just amazing because apparently they never do that. But I think he, he did realise once he got Grace sitting in front of him that he was, you know, this was an old woman who'd had enough, really. Well, two of us, two old women who'd had enough. And, uh, yeah, he said that. And that was how we knew. And that was why we were rejoicing so much. But, yeah, that was it. That was how I had to prove to <laughs> prove to the Home Office that I'm an expert. Hope I don't have to do that again. But I've got those letters in my in my quiver now. If anybody wants them, I can call them out. If it wasn't so serious, it would be quite amusing. Uh, exactly. it? <laughs> and I think the whole thing, as you say, proving proving your sexuality. If it wasn't so serious, it would be ridiculous. I do sometimes think if I'd actually had the courage or the bad judgment to say to that judge, you know, my lord, um, could you prove to me that you're heterosexual? That's a brilliant question. How would you do it? And, and the other thing, of course, is that the Home Office have clearly got a mental picture of what constitutes um, evidence of sexuality. And it's based, I think, on, on a fairly stereotyped U British or at least Western European gay male experience. So if you can prove that you're a regular at a gay club in the gay village or you're regularly seen in a gay bar, then that's, that counts as evidence. But let's face it, if you're a woman, you probably, of a certain age, you probably haven't done that anyway because lesbian culture has always been slightly different. Uh, and also, if you've just arrived in the country and you don't speak the language very well, asking you what is the name of the third gay bar on the left in Manchester's gay village is not going to get an answer um, because you've probably never been there. And the whole thing is just ridiculous. And, and several, as you see in the book, several of the women were told you don't look like a lesbian. Which raises the old question that I still ask myself, what does a lesbian look like? I've actually got a book printed in the 1980s called What Does a Lesbian Look Like? <laughs> I mean, it's a very good question. It's it's all sorts of things. It's age, it's age related. It's culture related. What a lesbian looks like is is so determined by that particular woman's cultural background and and life experience. And you know, um, I sat with one very butch young woman who you know I'd have picked out a mile off, even though I don't always kind of tell with very young people these days. My gay dad doesn't function. Um, <laughs> But I, I was sitting there enjoying her company and thinking, you know, she's, she's rather lovely and she's very butch. And um, I said to her, well, why did the Home Office turn you down? And she said, well, they didn't think I was a lesbian. Uh, and I, well, that's, that's really I interesting. Still, I can still hear myself on the tape going, have they looked at you? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but th this is an, an issue in, in itself because we are living in a time when straight institutional structures are trying to be more inclusive yet due to the lack of understanding and experience of the community apply rather rigid tick boxes still to the actual diversity that exists within we're not a homogenous community oh, that's, that's so true and um it is very difficult um but Speaking of difficult situations, I was reminded of one thing that comes up time and time again, which also I've heard of personally without this book even, which mm -hmm. is the Croydon assessment process yeah. or the Croydon assessment center. So for those of you who are listening from a non-UK place, there is a part of London called Croydon, which is mainly famous for a huge roundabout that is dangerous to navigate. And it's socioeconomically speaking, maybe more associated with working class it's it's partly gentrified these days it's, it's also famous for having one of the biggest ikeas yes. in the world yes. yes it has a beautiful ikea but um on a rainy london day croydon can feel daunting but it is also home to many people but um for people who are seeking asylum they would associate it with the assessment center or which is a sort of home office branch where you get an interview mm. and i was wondering if you can tell a little bit about that because when i was reading your book i got the impression that there is a little bit of bureaucratic instrumentalization of trauma and, and maybe even re-traumatizing of people, which I found really, really heartbreaking to read. Yes, I think the Croydon interview is possibly one of the chanciest and most, well, many parts of the, of the story and many parts of the system are re-traumatizing, I have to say. But it's, it's the first step on your asylum journey. If you arrive in this country 
and claim asylum at once, which is what you're meant to do. Get off the plane, come through customs and go up to somebody and say, I wish to claim asylum in this country. Uh, Of course, that's not actually what happens to everybody. And the stories in the book show that you could be in the UK for quite a long time before you knew that you could claim asylum or before you had cause to claim asylum. But the idea is that you do it when you arrive. But whenever you make your actual first claim, uh, first application to, to be what an asylum seeker is actually a, a status that you can you, that you are given if they if you go to Croydon, wherever in the country you arrive. So sometimes it's a very long train journey. Um, you go to Croydon to this office and you have an interview with an official. Now I've not been there, so. I hope I'm not talking through my hat, but from the stories that I've been told, it appears to me that it's not an entirely private thing. I don't think you get taken into a room and the door shut. It it sounds from many of the stories as if you walk up to a counter, a bit like the post office, and somewhere the other side of a barrier not far away from you, there's somebody else talking to somebody else at that counter. I, I get the impression that people felt very exposed. You wait a long time, you get called up, and you get asked about why you're claiming asylum and you get asked to tell your story there and then um, without total privacy and without preparation. Um, And, of course, a lot of the women who come to this place have, or most of them, have suffered um, various forms of sexual violence, sometimes trafficking, sometimes modern slavery, various kinds of, of trauma. And they also very often come from cultures in which those things are not talked about explicitly out loud. Mm. Their language even sometimes doesn't make allowance for saying, I mean, I, this is something a woman told me recently and it's stuck in my mind. She said, in Zimbabwe, we never say, even about straight people, we don't actually say out, straight out they were having sexual intercourse. She said, that's something I've learned since I've learned English. She said, we say, they found them sleeping. <laughs> That's as far as we ever go. So when the Home Office says to me, well, what were you doing with this woman? I said, I was sleeping. So there are lots of problems. But wow. the other thing um, that I've heard is that uh, several people have said that they were provided with interpreters because at that moment in time, you know if you, yourself, if you go to a foreign country, even if you know the language in theory, it takes quite a long time to get your ear in, doesn't yeah. it? So they're they're really struggling to communicate at Croydon very often. So I give them an interpreter. And I've had more than one person say to me that the interpreter, who was of the same uh, nationality as themselves, was deeply homophobic. And when the interpreter heard them say that they were claiming asylum for this reason, they would be saying to them in their own language, oh, you filthy people, you shouldn't be... You know, really, really horrible, horrible homophobic mm. words. Um, and they're much too frightened, of course, and they think this person's an official that has power over them, much too frightened to complain at the time. So several people have had that. And then, of course, they don't know whether the person is translating their words honestly and fairly to to the Home Office official. So there are all kinds of bad things happen at Croydon. But what happens is that that person then decides, that official then decides whether you have got a case or not. So you can be deported from Croydon the moment you arrive, um, or at least detained, which is horrible. But if they think you have got a case to make, then you get official asylum seeker status and you get um, accommodation if you haven't got any, and you get an allowance to live on, which is under £40 a week at the moment. You're not allowed to claim benefits, contrary to so many people's beliefs. You're not allowed to work and therefore have some dignity and earn your own money. And you're not allowed to study beyond the very basic levels of English and so on. So you're shut up in this very, usually it's accommodation of multiple occupancy and it's not very nice. Uh, And the other asylum seekers in that accommodation might also be homophobic. And you're living on less than six pounds a day. Um, and you can't have a television because you don't have a fixed abode or you don't have a licence. Um, really, you are made destitute until the Home Office sees fit to give you what's called your substantive interview, which normally happens at Liverpool. 
and might be a few months later or might be many years later. And, and living with that uncertainty. Living with that uncertainty is, is just eats you away. Uh, and you're also probably living with trauma, which nobody is helping you with. Um, and eventually, you know, the, the lucky people find help from these voluntary organisations like the Lesbian Immigration Support Group and like a lot of um, LGBT support groups that are volunteer-based all up and down the country. And then you might also be directed to rape crisis counselling or, um, you know, whatever you need. But not everybody actually finds those support groups, I think, which is dreadful. Well, it's... it's, um such a niche thing in a sense because in order to claim asylum on the basis of your sexuality or the persecution of your sexuality i'm reminded of a refugee story that was a straight one that i was reading about where somebody said well i was fleeing the civil war from from a certain place um i forgot which one now and it was a place where tribes were basically having at at war with each other post election of some somebody and then I arrived in, I think it was Belgium at the time, similar system. Absolutely. And, and she sort of yeah. said, well, I arrived at, at the center and I was actually mixed with the people that I fled from because from the other side, people had fled as well because there was a cultural unawareness of what was actually going on in the place where I was fleeing. And it's sort of similar by the sounds of it because you can be put into a place of multiple occupancy where you then have people persecuting you again based on your sexuality. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely right. Um, I think what the Conservative government named the hostile environment was meant for Mm. um, illegal migrants. They didn't want people coming into the country illegally. Um, But they have, I think, allowed, if not actively encouraged, a confusion in people's minds about... Asylum seekers, there is nothing illegal about an asylum seeker. It is legal in international law to go to any country in the world and say, I wish to claim asylum. You've then got to prove your case, but there is nothing illegal ever about an asylum seeker. It's a tough road. It's a very tough road. One thing that I read in in your book as well, as as part of the Croydon assessment, medical records are shared. So you're exposed from literally all angles. You're interviewed about what you do in bed which, I mean, for Westerners half the time, you don't want to answer that. No, of course Um, not. It's very intrusive questions. And then also you're interviewed in a sort of blasé way, maybe in a place where there's no privacy about Mm -hmm. trauma, like suicidal incidents, stuff like that. I think think it's very random um, Mm. because I have heard good stories. Okay. One One or two. I've heard a story of a woman who went for her substantive interview at Liverpool and she thought it was going to be really hard because she's heard everybody else's story and she was really terrified. And the woman officer who interviewed her said to her, I've read all your evidence and I do want to say to you, when you go from here, you will make, look, here here is some uh, uh, some information about rape crisis counselling, about um, therapy for trauma. You will access it, won't you? I really want you to. And she was incredibly supportive. And this woman got her uh, status, got her acceptance as a refugee and got her uh, asylum um, within about three weeks of her Liverpool interview. So That's encouraging. There are good people there. And it's very much a matter of being helped to get your evidence right. It's been very difficult to build up any evidence during pandemic lockdown because you can't go and take part in lesbian things and have photos taken of you doing it because there weren't any things to take part in it's been very hard this last year <laughs> it's, it's funny that that counts as evidence and i'm also reminded of the fact that if you're really closeted and have to watch your back about being gay you're not going to have any bloody evidence <laughs> you're going to make sure there's no absolutely. <laughs> absolutely oh gosh oh dear um there was one story that i found very touching of mary uh where there was almost like an uh, accusation by association. If if your parents let you be a lesbian, then they must be devil worshippers. They're devil worshippers. Yes, that's right. Um, that is that is a truly horrible story. Yeah. Um, told by a very a very beautiful and, and patient woman. Um, but yes, they her whole family. So now that's interesting because so often our stories um, are that the parents reject the child. 
or submit them to religious um, conversion therapy or whatever. But in Mary's case, her parents stood by her, her family stood by her, and they all suffered horribly for it. Uh, as you read in the story, um, they, they wouldn't abandon their daughter. Um, they Well, her father died um, from what happened to him, and she and her mother and her sister um, are all in England seeking asylum together now. Mm. But the Home Office thinks it would be a good idea for them just to go back to Kenya and um, just live in a different part where nobody knew them. Yeah, I'm having a bit of a reaction to that statement, I'm noticing. Um, it's it's heartbreaking, and, and we're not going to go too much into detail about the stories because, quite frankly... I want people to read it and, and also give people the uh, privilege of reading it yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in the voices. Um, yeah, I was wondering, how has hearing those stories changed your own relationship to the UK's laws, but also maybe your own sexuality? Well, I suppose it does bring home to you that, I mean, I'm old enough to remember a time when my sexual orientation was a problem, um, and, you know, when attitudes in this country towards homosexuality and everything associated with it were very, very negative. I have had friends that were beaten up, maybe, and, and friends who suffered psychologically because of that. But it just pales into insignificance, actually. It reminds me that it isn't that long ago that it was bad here, but it was never as bad as it is in some of these places. And it's quite complicated, because a lot of the homophobic persecution that takes place in countries which were previously part of the British Empire, those attitudes were actually put there by us, by the British, during the days of empire. Um, and there are lots of very interesting work going on in, in various parts of, of university research by people from India and from Africa, mm. showing that the cultures which were suppressed by the British and by other European colonisers, obviously, uh, were often very much more friendly towards same-sex relationships um, and had a place, you know, a cultural place for them. But the persecution that we're now saying we disapprove of is actually the result of 19th century British laws, very often, that were brought in. Um, when those places were, were colonised. So it's really complicated, really complicated. Maybe it goes back to an earlier part of this conversation um, and, and leaves us with a responsibility to try and do something um, for those people. I don't know. It's, it's a tricky question. I mean, part of me is sitting here thinking, what is it about societies that makes the notion of lesbianism, gayness, etc., bisexuals, um, so insufferable, so challenging why is it so challenging to certain societies well we can't solve that one in the next few minutes but it has quite a lot to do with masculinity and patriarchy um and uh, yeah I, i i don't think we can have an answer on that we, i mean if anything any answer would always be a bit of a personal one i think for myself there is a sense of it starts in your own family right like culture starts in your own family Absolutely. And um, if I think of my family, we have a lot of very strong women in our family, but they're also very conservative. I associate their, their resilience and their dismissiveness and getting down to business with a sense of conservatism. That's not necessarily bad, by the way. It's just it is also marked by a lack of openness. Blood is thicker than water. Trust those ones that, you know, are your family over strangers and... What we know is good. What we don't know, we don't trust. And being the only gay in my family, as far as I can ascertain, I'm sure maybe there's others that I wouldn't know of. I think I challenge that openness quite a bit. So maybe that's what I can say in terms of just a little microcosm of, of my life. But it's it's a yeah. Yeah. diverse answer from person to person, maybe. And then it, it gets carried into the state, into the system. Religion is part of it, you know. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. And then we enter patriarchy as well. <laughs> Yeah. With this book comes a really honourable donation campaign, I'd say. Can you tell me a little bit about where the proceeds go well, and um, also where the Lesbian Immigration Support Group is these days? Well, the, the book's got multiple aims. Obviously, awareness raising is one, making people's voices heard who have felt unheard. And I know that the volunteers in the Lesbian Immigration Support Group would very much like 
uh, one result of the book to be that other groups are formed in other parts of the country. But yes, the other thing is that um, there were certain costs associated with with having the book published. But when we've paid those, the rest of the uh, any profit that comes out goes to the work work of the group. And what the group do is that they give practical and financial as well as moral and emotional support to the members. And they can only manage to have a certain number of of, um, women in the group, members of the group, because it is such a a time-consuming and emotionally consuming work. And normally there are about 25 to 30 people in the Lesbian Immigration Support Group. They had more money and they had more volunteers, then there could be more members. Um, But there's always a bit of a waiting list. Um, People are referred there by all sorts of of agencies um, locally who know about them. So the sort of things they do, they help people financially. During the pandemic, for instance, they raised a lot of money to buy little tabletop fridges for the women to have in their rooms so they didn't have to use the communal kitchens, which were quite dangerous. Um, They have managed to approach various uh, supermarket chains to get uh, grocery vouchers because the women are pretty much on the breadline. Another thing that they like to be able to afford to um, get for the members is uh, money, money on their phones because your mobile phone is your only means of communication with your family back home, if you are still in touch with them, with your children that you left behind. Um, And it has to be pay as you go because you can't afford a contract. So uh, you'll often hear people in the story say, so I put some money on my phone and I phone my son. Um, So that's, that's something else. And when they do get their status, and I have to say the extraordinary thing about this group is that so far they haven't had, and I'm touching wood as I say it, but I do trust trust their wonderfulness. They've not had anybody deported. They've had people detained, but they've got them out again. They've not had anybody deported. So eventually they say to everybody, you must just wait because eventually your turn will come. You will get your status. And when they do, of course, um, then they've got to start life all over again and they're eligible for um, social housing which means they'll eventually have a flat of their own, but it won't have any furniture in it. So it's nice then to be able to find the money to help them with the basics um, to start them off. So there's lots and lots of things, and the more money they've got, the better. Um, so and you don't you don't have to wait until you've got your book in your hand. You can donate. Um, any, anyone can donate at any time. Just just look up the Lesbian Immigration Support Group on the internet. They're about to launch their new website, which will make it much easier to donate, but it is still possible. We'll, we'll try and post a link and keep it updated. Yes, that'd be um, good. For that too, mm-hmm. yeah. No, and as you were talking, it's, it's really nice. I think it's easy to get lost in the um, grimness of the process, but there are flickers of hope here and there, and it's nice to see the, the wonderful work that the Lesbian Immigration Support Group is doing. These women know how to find joy in small things. I mean, that's another thing they've taught me. The, the, when they can have their face-to-face meetings, they can't at the moment, we're having Zoom meetings, the absolute joy of being together um, and, and the love that pours out between them is, is a wonderful thing. Well, I'm, I'm just going to say to the listeners, if you're feeling a calling or if you're feeling like your hands are kind of tingling right now, maybe that's a sign that you should set up a lesbian immigration support group. And of course, the next thing is I don't currently have a new project. So if anybody feels moved to tell me what my next oral history project <laughs> ought to be, <laughs> feel free to do so. Brilliant. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll carry that through the airwaves for sure. Um, I was I was sort of gripped by your passion for how you collect these stories. And I'm wondering, because uh, we have talked about the idea of collecting oral history before, and, and, and I think there must be quite a skill to that. So how do you do it? How do you remain sort of a blank canvas upon which people can project their voice? Uh, when you start a PhD, you have to do cert- what they call method training. You train in research methods. Um, and you train in the research methods that you think are going to be useful for your particular research. So I had to go to statistics. I, I, I never, I, I went, I started that course three times and I never got past about week three. Um, but I did, I really tried. Um, but I, and I also went to um, anthropology because I was technically, if you think about it, 
studying a particular tribe. And that was very useful a way of thinking about it. But I also went, um, sat in on another MA course, which was the now sadly no longer happening, but very, very famous um, Sussex oral history MA. Margareta Jolly was in charge of it, and she's a very famous oral historian. And it was a very, very good course. And we actually spent a lot of time thinking about how you do it, um, you know, in practical ways, but also how you do it ethically, what the challenges might be when you're actually in a room with somebody listening to, you don't know what's going to come out. Um, thinking about those sort of all the all the issues around the doing of oral history um, before I actually did it, and that was enormously valuable. I think interviewing the old lesbians was hard in a different way for me. It was very rewarding. But I was a lot of the time hearing my own story. Uh, The end of it was that I understood my own story much better than I had before I started out. So that was very that was very good. Um, But with the um, women seeking asylum, I was very worried about doing what the Home Office does, which is making them tell their story, Mm. Uh, you know, and therefore re-traumatising them. Uh, and I've been warned about this. You know, you don't ask a person seeking asylum to tell you their story because they're always being asked to do it by officials and so on. But the women had volunteered and they were, it turned out, very, very keen to do it um, for this purpose as opposed to the purposes of the Home Office. And sometimes it was hard for them to say the words and hard for them to tell certain parts of their stories. But to a woman, you know, they pressed on because they really wanted to do it. Uh, so no, it wasn't. It wasn't particularly easy that part of it, but you know, it's very worthwhile. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm just sitting here saying to myself, you know, <laughs> what right have you got to be upset about this? You know, these are the people who've actually been through it, and they want to tell the story. So you shut up and listen. Yeah. And do you ask a lot of questions, or is it similar to the, the point in time when you have older lesbians and you just ask one questions and they're rolling because they've got the story? It varies from person to person. Um, and that's true with with all the work I've done. Um, there are people who you you know you sit down with them and you switch on the tape recorder. Listen to me, tape recorder. You know what I mean, uh, voice recorder. And, <laughs> Sounds more poetic. <laughs> um, and you say, I, I normally start by saying, uh, let, let's let's just begin by you telling me when and where you were born and a little bit about the family circumstances you grew up with because that's easy for everybody to do. And, and they can start off telling you a fact and then they've heard their own voice and they're not worried by hearing it. Um, and sometimes that's the last question you ask practically because people just go. And sometimes it's like drawing teeth. You have to ask, you know, you get you get quite good at asking open questions, but it's no good asking a question that can be answered with either a yes or a no if the person's finding it difficult to speak so then just say yes or no and then you're back where you were and you have to think of another question mostly though if people have agreed to do it they want to do it and as i say most people have got their story pretty well sorted by the time they're old but what's always interesting is the point at which they get so into it that they start remembering things they don't normally put into their story and if somebody says to you oh I don't think I've ever told anybody this, then you know you're really getting, uh, you know, they're they're really entering into it. Um, And then sometimes they get things in the wrong order and they say, oh, I don't think that was the date. Oh, dear, now I'm getting a bit mixed up here. Um, And that's where it's lovely to be able to edit it um, afterwards. But, uh, no, by and large, well, you you can't legislate. And some people have done and dusted in an hour and some people are still going after four hours and, you know, you could go back the next day. But, um, yeah, it's very varied, very varied. Yeah. Well, it's it's a testament to the relationship you're able to establish with, with the women and, and also the trust that is kind of forwarded to you. It's really... Yes, it's interesting that, I mean, I did feel with my um, work with the older lesbians, sometimes I drove many, many miles and I knew that I was only going to have that afternoon One of the things that helped with that was, so there's no time to make a relationship beforehand. You just sort of went in, sat down and did it. But because they knew that I was also an old lesbian, that covered a great deal of distance before we started. 
there was a, an assumption that we had something in common and there was an assumption of trust, I think. So that was very, very helpful. Yeah. So so one question I wanted to ask you is, can you tell me more about Jay Tavener and what might be the backstory of your involvement into projects and books under this pseudonym? Jay Tavener, yes, now she's another whole story. Um, when my long-term partner and I were together, we wrote lesbian historical fiction, or as we might say now, sapphic stories, or whatever word you want to put it. But when we were young, we felt that there were no stories with women like us in them. And eventually we just got on with it and wrote some for ourselves. And those, there were three while we still were together. And they were published by, oh, all published by publishers who no longer exist, which is interesting, because two of them were published by the famous Only Women Press. And the other was published by something called Diva Books, which was an offshoot of Diva magazine in those days. That doesn't exist either. So eventually they all went out of print and we parted and the years went by and all our readers got old. And then we suddenly decided that we would see if we could still co-write. And I have to say, I don't think either of us really expected that we would still be able to do it because it's quite an intimate activity. It's all one thing if you're partners with somebody, but if you've gone through, you know, a nasty breakup and some difficulties and things, you really think you could still be able to do that thing. And we found that we could. Wow. We had half a novel left over from when we were together, so we fished it out of the cupboard, or rather Jackie did, because I throw things away and she keeps things. So she went in, went in the loft and found all the bits and pieces. And, And we finished it. Um, and again, like the book I published myself earlier in the year, I think lockdown was our friend. It, we got on with it quite fast because there wasn't anything else to do. And uh, it's called Liberty. It's um, a rollicking sapphic adventure set at the time of the French Revolution. It's Part of the story is in New England, in uh, Salem, Massachusetts. Part of it is on the high seas, where one of our heroines is disguised as a cabin boy. Uh, part of it is in Bordeaux at the time of the revolution, with lots of mob violence and rushing about and such. And the last part of it, of course, is in England, because it is part of the series, which all the books are part of. So, yeah, we had a great time. We had a fabulous um, in-person book launch just before COVID struck again and all the rest of it's been online. So all the people who didn't know Jay Tavener back in the day, because they probably weren't even born, um, now can read all the stories again, particularly this one. This one's called Liberty. Liberty. And you can get yeah. it. It's available in Days the Word. It's available through all good bookshops. Um, yeah. Well, we'd encourage uh, everybody listening to try and source any of uh, Jane's or Jay Tavener's books via independent bookshops that's always a good idea and anybody who wants a signed copy can just get in touch with me yes and we'll post a link to that in the description of the episode fantastic um and also just to circle back quickly to your other book free to be me you can order it through bookshops yeah but i that one i really prefer to sell personally yeah. simply because the profits from it go to the work of the lesbian immigration support group And we get more if we sell it direct. So again, anyone who wishes to contact me um, about that book, I'll be very happy to post one out to them. Fantastic. Jane, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, I couldn't finish this podcast without a last question. And the question is, if you could have a lesbian affair with somebody from past, present, history, fiction, film, who would it be and why? Oh, my goodness, there are too many to choose. Pick a couple then. No, I had... I, I, <laughs> The trouble is, most of the famous lesbians of the past might have been very sexy and wonderful, but actually, if you'd known them, they all had the most frightful attitudes. Like, you you really would not have wanted to know Anne Lister. She was a, a, an upper-class Tory with the most dreadful attitudes to almost everything. And I think the same goes for a lot of, a lot of um, famous fascist lesbians of the 20th century. So it's really... That sounds like a book title. <laughs> Famous fascist lesbians. <laughs> <laughs> I always, I always was rather fond of an 18th century character called Charlotte Chark. She was a cross-dresser mm -hmm. uh, and a stage actor, 
and she um, belonged to a travelling theatre company in which she had a, uh, which she went by the name of Mr Brown. Um, she had a, a, a wifey called Mrs Brown who got her out of a lot of scrapes. And um, when I was teaching a lesbian history course last winter, I went back and refreshed my research into Charlotte Chark, who's always seemed to me to be the most um, charismatic character, and clearly was, because she got away with murder um, in, in the middle of the uh, 18th century. But I decided that probably she wasn't my dream lover after all, because uh, she... <laughs> She was just such a disaster. She couldn't She couldn't hold on to her mummy. She was always getting into terrible scrapes. And poor Mrs Brown ended up living in complete destitution with her because she she was just, oh, she just, everything she put her hand to failed, basically. But she still went about being wonderful and glamorous. And, you know, she's not, she's not a very good option either, is she? Um, I mean, it's it's interesting to which depths you consider it as an option because you're, you're not just going for looks. You're not just going for one component. You're going for the whole person. That's right. Absolutely. I yeah. suppose if it was a one night stand, it would be all right, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> that would, that wouldn't be too bad. Yeah. And I'm glad we got to hear about her because I had no idea about her. Oh, well, I'm, 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 I'm yes, maybe I, I should uh, teach that lesbian history course again and encourage everybody to come along. Brilliant. Well, I think a lot of people would really enjoy that. Jane, thank you so much. It's, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I really appreciate you taking the time for the Christmas episode. Well, Merry Christmas to you and yours <laughs> uh, and to everybody listening. Mm-hmm.